Violence, corruption, murder. After writing nearly half a dozen crime novels, I thought I understood every form of human depravity. But I was wrong. It wasn't until I visited Istanbul in the autumn of 1938 that I discovered the depths to which a man can sink. I'd gone there expecting rest, relaxation and sunshine. Instead, I found evil in all its sordid ugliness. And that evil had a name. Its name was Demetrius. The Mask of Demetrius by Eric Amber. Dramatised for radio by Stephen Sheridan. Episode 1. The Origins of an Obsession. Latimer, some more champagne? Yes, Madame Chavez. And wind up the gramophone again. Some of my guests are trying to dance. I'd been in Istanbul for nearly a week when Madame Chavez invited me to her villa on the Bosphorus. A mutual acquaintance had supplied me with a letter of introduction, and the day after I sent it, she wrote back insisting that I attend one of her parties. Oh, where is that lazy fellow with your champagne? I swear I'll give him such a hiding when he gets back. Please don't distress yourself on my account. I ought to be going soon anyway. Going? Oh, don't be silly, Mr. Latimer. You've only just got here. She was, of course, right. But her guests were a noisy and disagreeable bunch, and I longed for the peace and quiet of my hotel. Besides, you can't leave yet. Colonel Harkey has just arrived. Before I could say another word, she hurried across the room to greet a tall, rather predatory-looking figure in an immaculately pressed military uniform. <laughs> You're late, you naughty man. I thought you weren't coming. She began introducing him to her guests. I watched as he cracked jokes with the men and ogled the women. It was an impressive performance, and I was so enthralled that I almost jumped when Madame Chavez said my name. This is Charles Latimer, Colonel Harkey. He's a writer from England. How do you do, sir? How do you do? It is an honor to meet so distinguished a guest. Even in my country, your detective stories are well known. This was news to me, and I should like to have heard more about my Turkish celebrity. But before the colonel could continue, Madame Chavez bustled him away. And tired of the heat and the noise of the gramophone, I stepped outside onto the terrace. There you are, Mr. Latimer. I've been looking for you. Less than ten minutes later, I was joined by Colonel Haki. To be absolutely frank, you're the reason I'm here tonight. A cigarette. Thank you. I'm a busy man, but I couldn't pass up the chance to meet the writer whose work I so much admire. I read detective stories, you see. Nothing but detective stories. And I've just added the bloody shovel to my collection. Ah, yes. One of my first. A remarkable effort, Mr. Latimer. Quite remarkable. I'm not sure I fully understand the title, though. Well, it's an English expression, Colonel Hockey. When a man is unusually blunt, we always say that he's the sort who calls a spade. Yes, of course. I see it perfectly now. I wasn't sure that he did. I'm afraid I'm about to be summoned back to play the fool, though. Perhaps we could continue our conversation tomorrow, over lunch. Certainly. I'd like that. Shall we say the Para Palace Hotel at one o'clock? He waved over my shoulder at Madame Chavez, who had evidently just appeared on the terrace. Then, rather mysteriously, he leant right in. I have a feeling, Mr. Latimer, that I may be able to help you. <laughs> Charming! Who was Colonel Hockey? And why did he think I needed his help? The staff at my hotel could only tell me that he was supposedly the head of the secret police. And rather a bloodthirsty devil, too, they added, if you believed the stories. There you are, Mr. Latimer. Let's have a whiskey soda. I'll tell the waiter to bring us a bottle of Johnny. During the course of our meal, he discussed the detective novels he'd read and his preference for murderers who shot their victims. So much more artistic than a rope or a knife. Then, with an almost empty whiskey bottle at his elbow, he once more leant towards me. You remember, I said last night, I could help you. Well, Mr. Latimer, I want to give you a gift. Really? 
How kind. I've often thought that if I had more time, I could write a first-rate detective story myself. I know plenty of people who say the same thing. Ah, but unlike them, I've already worked out a plot. It concerns an elderly English nobleman who is shot through the head before he can change his will. The police think he was killed by a relative he was about to disinherit. But, as it turns out, the butler did it after the nobleman seduced his wife. The butler did it? Yes, ingenious is it not? Very. As I cannot make use of it myself, I would like to present it to you, the writer whose work has given me so much pleasure. I really don't know what to say. Say nothing until you have read my notes. I have them back at my office and I thought perhaps that if you're not too busy... Under the circumstances, Colonel Haki, I don't see how I could possibly refuse. <laughs> I have decided to call it the case of the bloodstained will. I'm not convinced it is the best title in the world, but all the good ones have been used, I find. Colonel Harkey sat on the edge of his desk, watching as I read through his notes. I felt some relief as I got to the end, having struggled on several occasions not to laugh. If you think it needs altering at all, then just let me know. I honestly don't see how you could possibly improve it. Good. I'll ask one of my men to make you a copy. Mehmet! Yes, Colonel Hockey. He summoned the clerk and gave him the notes. Then he returned to his desk and sat down. I must attend to a small matter while we're waiting. Do, please, feel free to smoke. Pretending to be preoccupied with my cigarette, I watched surreptitiously as Colonel Harkey opened a large manila folder and carefully studied its contents. There was an expression on his face that I hadn't seen before. It was that of an expert attending to a business that he understands perfectly. A moment ago, I had pitied him for inadvertently making a fool of himself. Now I realized that he needed no such consideration. As his long, yellowish fingers turned the pages of the folder, I knew that I was seeing the real Colonel Harkey for the very first time. Tell me, Mr. Nathaner. He suddenly looked up, and I was uneasily reminded of an old and experienced cat contemplating a young and innocent mouse. Are you interested in real murderers? I suppose so. Isn't everybody? I find murderers in detective stories much more sympathetic than those in real life. <laughs> Take the case of this man here. He tapped on the manila folder and said the name that would come so soon to haunt me. Take the case of Demetrius. What about it? He is what a real murderer is like. Ah, we've known of his existence for nearly 20 years. A dirty, cowardly type, murder, espionage, drugs, that is his history. He was also involved in at least one case of political assassination. Assassination? Surely that argues a certain courage. Oh, my dear fellow Demetrius, but nothing to do with the actual shooting. Men like him are merely intermediaries. They introduce the ones who do the killing to the ones who want it done. I see. In cases of assassination, it's not who fired the shot that matters, but who paid for the bullet. And the rats like Demetrius well, will always name them to save their own skins. I grant you, though, he was cleverer than most. Oh? As far as I'm aware, no government ever arrested him, and there is no photograph of him on file. But we knew him all right. And so did Sofia and Belgrade and Paris. He was a great traveller, was Demetrius. Was? You make it sound as though he's dead. Yes, he's dead. Some fishermen pulled him out of the Bosphorus last night. It's believed he'd been knifed and thrown overboard from a ship. At least he met a violent end. That's a kind of justice. <laughs> there speaks the writer. Everything must be neat and artistic like in a detective story. But the story of Demetrius is full of loose ends. Let me tell you more about it. Then you can decide for yourself. 
if it's artistic or not. He picked up the manila folder from his desk and began flicking through its pages. Details of his early life are scarce and unreliable. He was born Demetrius Macropolis in 1889. A citizen of Greece, he moved to Turkey while still quite young. And it's in Turkey that things start to get interesting. I'm interested already. He was working as a fig packer in Schmerner when, in 1922, his country and mine went to war. His life, which cannot have been an easy one, suddenly became a great deal harder. It must have. I cannot condone everything that was done by my fellow countrymen, Mr. Latimer, but feelings against all Greeks were running high. Those with money bought passage back to Athens on the refugee ships hidden along the coast. Those without were left behind to suffer most unpleasant fates. And... Demetrius? Well, had he been an ordinary man, he might have ended up dead like so many others. But Demetrius was cunning. And Demetrius had a friend. A friend named Dries Mohammed. Mohammed, for pity's sake, open up! According to the testimony that Dries Mohammed later supplied, Demetrius came to his house one night in late September seeking admittance. Go away! You can't come in. Demetrius persisted, however. Please, I beg of you, I'm your friend. And against his better judgment, Mohammed opened the door. As soon as he was inside, Demetrius begged him for help. The mob, they're everywhere. You've got to hide me. I can't. If they find you here with me, I'll die too. Oh, money then, to get me back to Greece. I haven't any money, you know that. I'm as poor as you. Mohammed fetched him bread and a cup of water. And as he ate, he steadily grew calmer. Of course, there is another way. It was at this point that Demetrius finally showed his true colors. Do you know old Sholem? The moneylender? Of course. Mm. But he's a hard man. He won't help. A hard man, yes, but a rich one, too. He has thousands of drachma hidden under the floorboards of his house. Thousands and thousands of them. Why are you telling me this? We're younger than him. We could easily overpower him and take it all. No, Domitius. It is forbidden to steal from your fellow man. It says so in the book. From a true believer, yes. But Sholem's a heathen. He worships a false god. And think what you could buy with thousands of drachma. As soon as the curfew had started, they picked their way to Sholem's house, and Demetrius began pounding on his door. What is it? I'm trying to sleep! Military police, we need to come in! As soon as Sholem opened the door, they were upon him. Quiet, you old dog, or I'll slit your throat! No violence! You said no violence! I'll tie him up! You check the floor! Try over there! Before long, Mohammed had located a loose board. He prized it up, and there, underneath, was a chest filled with cash. Look! Demetrius! We're rich! In his joy, he turned to where Demetrius was binding the old moneylender. He swore later on that when he saw Demetrius take out a knife, he thought it was to cut the ends of the rope. But instead, Demetrius plunged the blade into Sholem's neck and pulled it across. No, Demetrius, no! Shut up, you fool! He saw what we looked like. We had to kill him. They'll hang us for this. Hang us. Only if they catch us. I've got enough to get me to Athens. And me? Are you going to kill me too? Of course not. You're my friend. Here, take off the money. You've earned it, God knows. Well, Mr. Latimer, that is the story. Squally, dirty, quite inartistic. <laughs> Tell me honestly, is there anything about it that could possibly be of interest to a writer? The workings of the criminal mind are always of interest, Colonel Haki. But what became of Dries Mohammed? Well, he's the sort whose head becomes empty when his purse becomes full. One night he started boasting in his cups of what he had done. 
It was enough to have him arrested and brought before me. Brought before you? Yes, Mr. Latimer. I was the president of the court-martial that tried him. I listened carefully to his evidence, but his story was impossible to prove. So I sent him to the gallows. I see. And Demetrius? A warrant was issued for his arrest. It's probably still in force, but he was already back in Athens by then and beyond our reach. That wasn't the last you heard of him, though. Surely? No, Mr. Latimer, far from it. He sat back in his chair and smiled expansively. He seemed pleased to have so attentive an audience. He next came to my attention a year later. I was in charge of the secret police by then, and one day I was contacted by my counterpart in Sofia. An attempt had been made on the life of Stabuleski, the Bulgarian prime minister, and Demetrius was wanted in connection with the crime. It was at this point that I knew I was hearing something remarkable. How could anyone go from backstreet murder to political assassination in only a year? Actually, I sent the authorities the description we'd had of him from Dries Mohammed, but through the form, he'd fled before they could reach him. Did they ever manage to ascertain where he'd gone? No. They interviewed a woman who knew him at the time, but apparently she was of very little use. You also said something about him being involved in espionage. Did I? Perhaps I did. He smiled at me and lit a cigarette. He'd taken to calling himself Demetrius Talat by then, and in 1926 the police in Belgrade tried to arrest him for stealing documents from the Yugoslav government. I found myself leaning forward in my chair, eager for more information. I'd spent my career writing about criminals, but never in my wildest imaginings could I have devised a character as extraordinary as Demetrius. Needless to say, he escaped their net and fled to Paris. That might have been the end of him. But in 1931, he emerged as the head of a smuggling ring. <sighs> Again, something new. What were they smuggling? Heroin. The quantities involved were enormous, and so were the profits. But then, quite suddenly, Demetrius finished with it. Why did he do that? The police in Paris had a theory that he'd become addicted to his own product. <laughs> but who can say? All we know for sure is that he wrote them a letter denouncing the other members of his gang and providing enough evidence to have them all convicted. I ought to have been surprised. But somehow Demetrius was already losing his ability to surprise me. Each one of them served a long prison sentence and several swore to kill him when they came out. Perhaps in the end, he signed his own death warrant. But look, Mr. Latimer, here comes my clerk with the plot of your next novel. I suppressed a groan. I wasn't interested in the case of the bloodstained will. I wanted to hear more about Demetrius. Ah, uh, Now I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. There is to be an inquest into Demetrius tomorrow, and I have to go to the mortuary to view his body. Can I come? I'm sorry? To the mortuary. Can I come? Huh? I was as astonished as the colonel at my own request, but it seemed the only way to prolong our conversation. Well, I dare say something could be arranged, but I'm not sure I understand well, why... I've never seen a mortuary before. Or a dead body. And I can't help feeling that a writer of detective stories ought to have seen both. My dear fellow, of course you ought. <laughs> it wasn't much of an explanation, but the colonel seemed satisfied. And who knows, we might be able to work a mortuary scene into the case of the bloodstained will. <laughs> the mortuary was made of corrugated iron and the heat inside was stifling. As the colonel pointed out, though, it didn't seem to bother the occupants. You there. We've come to see the body of Demetrius Macropolis. Of course, Colonel Aki. This way. The attendant led us to the corpse of a short, broad-shouldered man of about 50, lying on a high trestle table. It had been wrapped in a sheet so that only the head with its putty-colored face was visible. A small pile of clothing had been neatly folded alongside it. Well, Mr. Latimer, does he look as you expected? I'm not sure. The face is rounder, I suppose, and the lips a little more full. But it's the spirit of the man that interests me. 
And that's long since departed. How did you identify him? I'm sorry? You said there wasn't a photograph of him on file, so I was just wondering... We found a French identity card sewn inside the lining of his overcoat. The authorities in Paris have confirmed that it's genuine. Forgive me, Colonel Lackey, but may I have your signature on some of this paper? Uh, Yes, of course. Uh, Excuse me for a moment, Mr. Lazarus. It was as I stood on my own with the mortal remains of Demetrius that an idea suddenly came to me. I am not normally a man given to making rash decisions, but there was something so tantalizing about my idea, something so irresistible, that I knew almost at once that I should have to act upon it. The career of Demetrius had, I decided, been a kind of jigsaw puzzle, with little pieces of it scattered all over Europe. Were I to follow in his footsteps, interviewing the people who had known him and trying to uncover new facts, then surely, at the end of it all, I'd be able to put the pieces together and form a picture of the man. Do you have anything else for me to sign? No, Colonel Lackey, that was the last. Athens would be the logical place to begin my exercise in detection. That was where Demetrius had fled after the murder of Sholem. I knew from the start, of course, that the whole enterprise was probably doomed to fail. But for a few short weeks, I would be like the hero of one of my own novels. And wouldn't that be a fascinating thing? Life is curious, is it not, Mr. Latimer? I looked up as Colonel Haki came back. For nearly 20 years, I've known about Demetrius, but this is the first time I have met him face to face. I should like to see some of the things those eyes have seen. But the lips... We'll never tell of them now. I nodded absently, but my mind was on other things. I was already planning the first stage of my journey. The waters of the Aegean were unusually choppy when, three days later, I boarded a ferry for Greece. I've never been a good sailor, so I tried to occupy my mind by writing down what I knew about Demetrius. It only took me a few minutes to complete, and when I'd finished, I wondered gloomily what I could hope to achieve with so little information. Despite everything, however, I found I was looking forward to seeing Athens again. It would make a pleasant change of scene after Istanbul, and anyway, I'd be staying at the home of a very dear friend. Oh, go on, Charles. Join me for another. No, really, I must know. <laughs> of course you must. We're having a celebration. Paul Siantos was my Greek publisher, and the warmth of his welcome had lifted my spirits. It isn't every day you visit me, after all. When were you last here? I dread to think. You don't seem to have aged much, though. Oh, <laughs> really? You mean it? His appetite for compliments was one of his most endearing traits. Thank you. Now I recall why I like you so much. It would have been pleasant to spend the rest of the evening drinking Retsina with Siantos, but I knew I mustn't forget why I was there. And I asked him if he'd lived in Athens all his life. Yes, more or less. You must remember the refugees of 1922, then. The ones who came here from Turkey. What a curious question. No one who saw them could ever forget. They came here in their thousands, starving, half-naked and full of disease. Do you know if a register was made of them at the time? I should very much like to examine it if there was. Mm, That's a tall order. There were so many of them and in such a state. He paused and I waited for the inevitable question. Why would you want to look at it anyway? I wasn't ready to explain about Demetrius yet so I told him it was research for my latest novel. He believed me, of course. People believe anything about writers. If such a register does exist, it won't be easy to gain access. A great many civil servants will have to be bought a great many drinks. That's why I've come to you. You're the most resourceful man I've ever met. Oh, I don't know, Charles. The whole thing sounds fraught with difficulty. Am I really the most resourceful man you've ever met? Absolutely. Oh, very well then. I'll do what I can. It took Siantos a week to establish that the register even existed. After that, 
he went to work in earnest, slaking the thirst of every civil servant he had to. Finally, when I'd been granted all the necessary permits, I presented myself at the local Bureau of Records. Hey, your papers all seem in order, Mr. Latimer. Now then, who was it you wanted to know about? A fig packer named Demetrius Macropolis. He came here in October 1922. Demetrius Macropolis. Oh. Yeah, if there's a record of anyone with that name, we will find it down in the basement. <laughs> Please, come this way. Thank you. Oh, look at that. He's gone already. I'm sorry? Who's gone? Well, didn't you notice? A rather peculiar-looking gentleman came in just now, but when he heard me talking to you, he turned on his heel and left. Really? How odd. Well, people have no patience nowadays, I find. And I get no help with my work, you know. None whatsoever. The official led me down a flight of stone steps to a dimly lit basement lined with row upon row of steel cabinets. I hope you're impressed by how well organized I am. <laughs> Very. Yeah. Organization is the secret of modern statecraft. Organization will make Greece great again. Yeah. Demetrius Macropolis, you say? Yes. Yeah, if we have a record, it will be here in draw 16. I watched as with practiced fingers he flipped through the files. Oh. I'm sorry, there's no record of anyone with that name. But th there must be. Please, try again. I told you. There's no record. I've come all this way for nothing, then. Perhaps so. Um, perhaps if you had more information... Talat. I beg your pardon? Try under Demetrius Talat. But that's a Turkish it, name. I know, but try. The official told me that anyone called Demetrius Talat will be found in drawer 27, but when he looked, I was disappointed again. No, I'm sorry. No Demetrius Talat either. I see. Ah. There is a Demetrius Taladis, though. Taladis? Yes. Uh, born Larissa, 1889. Ah, a fig packer, too, just like you said. I felt a sudden stab of triumph. So Demetrius had changed his name again. That was something even Colonel Harkey didn't know. He arrived here from Smyrna in October 1922. Hmm. Apparently, he didn't have an identity card. <laughs> he claimed he'd lost it. Well, he would do if he was passing himself off under an assumed name. Yeah, he was classified as fit and free from disease and assigned to a refugee camp in Tuboria. And then it seems... Yes? Hmm, this is rather disturbing. In November 1922, the Athens police issued a warrant for his arrest on a charge of robbery and attempted murder. I wasn't surprised. If Demetrius had arrived in Athens fit and free from disease, it must have cost him all of Sholem's money to do it. And when he needed more, he certainly wasn't going to start packing figs again. According to his records, he evaded capture and escaped by sea. Hmm. I wonder where he went. He went, of course, to Sofia. And a week later, I left Athens for the same destination. As my train rattled through the night, I wondered how much I could hope to uncover about the involvement of Demetrius in the attempted assassination of the Bulgarian Prime Minister. Siantos had supplied me with a letter of introduction to a Greek journalist he knew who worked in Sofia, so at least I had somewhere to start. Uh, this way, sir. You're in here. I'd been hoping to have the sleeping car to myself, Thank you, so I wasn't boy, best pleased when a guard ushered in a fat, unhealthy-looking man of about 55. I'm afraid I must apologize for intruding on your privacy. Not at all. There's plenty of room. How good of you to say so. He treated me to a saccharine smile, exposing a startling expanse of large, unnaturally white false teeth. There's so little kindliness in the world nowadays, so little thought for others, that it gladdens my heart to hear a few friendly words. May I ask how far you're going? To Sofia. Oh, a lovely city, quite lovely. I'm going on to Bucharest. He turned and began unpacking his valise, 
taking out thick woolen pajamas and bright yellow bed socks. I was so pleased when the attendant told me there was an Englishman on board. I have a great regard for the English. But I thought... Your own nationality? I am a citizen of the world. To me, all countries, all languages are beautiful. Do you mind if I smoke? I'll be my guest. I won't join you, though. It's, it's time I turned in. The fat man lit himself a cheroot and sat happily puffing whilst I went and laid down on my bed. When I looked again, he was dabbing at his face with a bed sock. Smoking is such a silly habit. It irritates the eyes, and the great one, in his wisdom, has made mine very weak. Dear me. Perhaps you need glasses. If I needed glasses, the great one would guide me to seek them out. Do you not feel, my friend, that somewhere above us, about us, within us, there is a power, a destiny, that directs us to do the things we do? That's a very large question. Only because we are not simple enough, not humble enough to understand it. A man does not need a great education to be a philosopher, though. Dear God, would he go on like this all night? Let him only be simple and humble. That is enough. There's a good deal in what you say. But now I'm afraid I really must sleep. Ah, sleep. The greatest mercy ever vouchsafed to suffering humanity. You mustn't allow me to deprive you of that. I muttered something under my breath and turned to face the wall, but still he went on. My name is Peters, by the way, Mr. Peters. And it's been a pleasure to find I'm sharing with so agreeable a companion. I dozed fitfully, watching the thin strip of sky between the blinds turn blue-black and then grey. The train was due in Sofia at seven, so I rose and collected together my belongings. Although I slid the compartment door open as gently as I could, Mr. Peters stirred and opened his eyes. Oh, is it morning already? I'm sorry, I tried not to wake you. Oh, it's of no consequence. I meant to tell you last night that the best hotel in Sofia is the Sovienska Beseda. That's very kind of you, but I've already wired a reservation from Athens to the Grand Palace. Do you know it? Yes, I believe it's very good. Enjoy your stay in Sofia, Mr. Latimer. Thank you. I'm sure I shall. I was so anxious to get to my hotel that it wasn't until a good deal later that a troubling question started to bother me. How on earth had Mr. Peters known my name? It says here that you're a writer of detective stories. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. I myself have little time for fiction. I deal only in facts. I was sitting in the office of Nicholas Marukakis, the newspaper man recommended to me by Cientos. He finished reading the letter of introduction I'd given him and fixed me with shrewd, penetrating eyes. Still, you're a fellow wordsmith, and that's what counts. How may I be of service? I'm investigating the circumstances surrounding the attempted assassination of Stambuliski, the Bulgarian Prime Minister. Siantos thought you might be able to help. The Stambuliski affair? Oh, that was a long time ago. I shall need a while to refresh my memory. Uh, perhaps if you could give me an hour or two? Why don't you come and have dinner with me this evening at my hotel? I'm staying at the Grand Palace. Yeah, I prefer not to dine in hotels. I find their atmosphere of bourgeois respectability dampens my appetite. Perhaps, if you'll permit it, I might suggest somewhere else. At eight o'clock that evening, I sat down with him in a tiny little restaurant above a grocery shop off the Rue Alabinska. Nazdravia, Mr. Latimer. Your very good health. He drained the glass of vodka he'd ordered from a drowsy-eyed waiter and watched, in satisfaction, as I did the same. Good. Now we have drunk vodka together, we are comrades, and I can be frank. Why are you really here? I'm researching a novel, didn't I say? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Latimer, but no. No, no, there is more to it than that. I'd like to tell you, honestly, but I'm afraid you'd think me a fool. Oh, you English! You're all so self-conscious. If I give you the information you want, will you tell me then? Yes, all right. It's a deal. The waiter brought us over some mashunascara, a delicious selection of grilled meats, and after we'd finished eating, Marakakis began to talk. Stambuliski became Bulgaria's prime minister in 1920. 
There were tensions with Serbia at the time, but he pursued the policy of non-aggression and they started to ease. Why would anyone want to assassinate him then? He was a peacemaker. Ah, uh, true. But not everyone loves peace. And when he visited Haskova in 1923, an attempt was made on his life. Was it ever determined who did it? The blame was put on a small cell of terrorist fanatics, but they were merely the puppets of the bank who funded them, the Eurasian Credit Trust. The Eurasian Credit Trust? Yeah, you won't have heard of them, and they'd prefer it that way. They hoped to make money by driving down the value of the Bulgarian lev, but Stambuliski's policies made it start to rise. So they tried to have him killed? That's obscene. Yeah, not to a bank. They know nothing of decency and care even less. Money is their only religion, and profit their only god. Would it be possible to find out more about what went on in Haskovo? What, after 15 years? Well, the police might tell you something, but I doubt it. Of course, if I knew why you're so interested. Marukakis looked at me expectantly. He'd kept his side of the bargain, so it was time to keep mine. We ordered ourselves two glasses of tea, and I tried, as best I could, to explain about Demetrius and my attempts to piece together the fragments of his life. He sat in silence after I'd finished. Then at last he spoke. It's curious, is it not? that a dead criminal should exert so strong a fascination? He's not just a dead criminal to me, though, Marakakis. That's rather the point. I'm convinced that if I can find out more about him, I can explain him, understand him, account for him. How much do you know about his time in Bulgaria? Almost nothing. But I have heard that he was involved in the Stambuliski affair. Yeah, that's certainly possible. The Eurasian Credit Trust is notorious for making use of foreign intermediaries. Unfortunately, the police here in Sofia never caught up with him. They did interview a woman who knew him, though. It would be interesting to talk with her, who did not. <sighs> Very, but I didn't even know her name. But it's bound to be in the police records. I can make some inquiries if you like. I wouldn't dream of it. There's nothing to prevent me from examining him myself. On the contrary, there is plenty to prevent you. In the first place, you don't read Bulgarian, and in the second, the police would never cooperate. Oh. I, on the other hand, I'm a fully accredited journalist, and that gives me certain privileges. Besides, absurd as it is, your fascination with Demetrius rather intrigues me. Come on. He gestured at the waiter, who was fast asleep in the now otherwise empty restaurant his feet resting on one of the tables. Let's wake that poor devil and settle our bill. I'll contact you as soon as I can. Less than 24 hours later, Marukakis telephoned my hotel with a name. Irana Privaza. I found her in the police records, just as I expected. She's currently the proprietress of a Nacht local called La Vierge Saint-Marie. A Nacht local? Uh, uh, a nightclub for a lonely gentleman might be the most charitable translation. She used to work there as one of the girls, but when she grew too old to attract customers, she used her savings to buy out the owner. I see. And where is this Nachtlokal? It's not very far. I'll pick you up in 20 minutes. La Vierge Saint-Marie was situated in a row of houses behind the church. We gave in our hats and coats and descended to a large, low-ceilinged basement, decorated in red plush and lined with gilt-edged mirrors. This way, monsieur. A waiter led us to a table and returned a few moments later with a bottle of champagne. It probably tastes like poison and costs 200 lira. I hope you've brought plenty of money. I nodded unenthusiastically and checked my wallet. Good evening, monsieur. Welcome to La Vierge Saint-Marie. I looked up as a tall, well-dressed woman of about 50 approached our table. Evidently this was Madame Pravaza. I hope you're enjoying yourselves, but if you'd care for a little company... She indicated a pair of girls who were gyrating listlessly together on the dance floor. Thank you, Madame Pravaza. We look forward to making their acquaintance later. But first, perhaps you'd do us the honor of joining us for a drink? Certainly, monsieur. As she sat down, I saw how weary she looked. How lined. This was not a woman whom life had treated kindly. I've uh, seen your picture, haven't I? You're Marikakis, the journalist. You're going to write something nice about me in the newspaper? 
No, madame. We are trespassing on your hospitality to ask for some information. Information? <laughs> Forgive me, monsieur, but I know nothing of interest to anyone. Uh, your discretion is legendary, but this concerns a man now dead and buried whom you knew 15 years ago. 15 years ago? <laughs> Holy mother of God. Uh, we appreciate that 15 years is a long time, but if a name means anything to you, it was Dimitrios. Dimitrios Macropolis. She'd been lighting a cigarette, but suddenly she froze and let it dangle, unlit between her fingers. Dimitrios. Yes. Your friend, is he a policeman? Uh, nothing so interesting. A writer. And he's the one who wants to know about Dimitrios? Yes. He saw his dead body in Istanbul a month or two ago and it piqued his curiosity. She turned and gripped my sleeve. He's dead. You're sure? You saw the body? Yes. He'd been stabbed and thrown in the sea. I don't suppose he had any money on him? No. I'm afraid not. I knew it. That son of a whore. A thousand francs he owed me, and now I'll never see it again. She let go of my sleeve, and I thought for a moment that she was going to strike me. But then instead, she started to shout. Get out! Go on! Get out the pair of you! Get out of my club and never come back! It was half past three, however, before Marukakis and I left La Vierge Saint-Marie. After exhorting us to get out, Madame Pravaza had suddenly become tearful and apologetic. She took us upstairs to her private office, where she explained that it had been a shock to hear the name of Demetrius again after so many years. I prefer only to think of the present now, you see, and of the future. Oh, an admirable philosophy, Madame Pravaza. Demetrius is not an easy man to forget, though. I tell you frankly, monsieur, he frightened me. Some men seek to be loved, but Demetrius was incapable of that. As long as one feared him, he was satisfied. When did you first meet? In December 1922. Oh, dear God, he was cold that year. I was living in a lodging house, and one afternoon I heard a terrible argument coming from the room next door. It was Demetrius. And the landlord. You stupid pig! I'll pay you when I'm good and ready! I'd been entertaining one of my gentleman friends, and as I returned from showing him out, Demetrius pushed past me and entered the room. So much fuss over a little drink. Do you have any money? No. Cigarette, then. You must have one of those. I went and fetched him one, and as he stood smoking, his eyes travelled slowly round the room. Yet cold, anxious eyes, like those of a doctor when he's doing something that hurts you. It's nice in here, but these are dangerous times. You need someone to look after you. <laughs> so that's what you're after, is it? No, thank you, monsieur. I'm doing perfectly well on my own. You do better with me, and I'll prove it. What would you say to 5,000 lever? I thought he was merely boasting, but the following day, he came to my room with the money. There you are, half for you and half for me. Why did you get this? It was easy. The gentleman who was here yesterday, your friend. What about him? I followed him home. When I threatened to tell his wife and daughters about where he spends his afternoons, he was only too happy to pay. Why did you do that? You've cost me a good friend for a few thousand lever. Do you know your trouble? No ambition. I can introduce you to better friends, richer friends. What do you say? I was worried he might make trouble, so I reluctantly agreed to let him look after me and asked what he wanted in return. Not too much. I'm a reasonable man. How about 50%? He kept his word. And the gentlemen he brought me to entertain were indeed a great deal richer. With the income I was supplying, he bought himself a smart new suit of clothes. And I heard that he'd started dabbling in politics. When he took me to a cafe that I knew was watched by the police, I told him he was being a fool. You think so, do you? If the authorities find you here, they'll have you deported. Oh, no, they won't. I know a lot of influential people now. They'll protect me, and one day soon, 
They'll make me rich. Rich? You'd still be dressed in rags if it weren't for me. Oh, don't, don't flatter yourself. I could have picked one of a thousand girls. I chose you because you're cunning and you can keep your head. You have no imagination, though. And you don't understand money. I understand it well enough. I'm just not obsessed by it. Then you're the fool. Money is everything, Arana. When you've got money, people respect you. They let you do as you please. Money buys power, and power's what counts. Perhaps I drank too much cheap wine, but as I listened to him talking so earnestly, I suddenly lost my fear of him and started to laugh. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry, Demetrius, but if you knew how pompous you sound... I said stop it! He smashed the glass he was holding on the edge of the table, and I saw in his eyes that he meant to cut me. No, Demetrius, don't! He struggled to control himself, then threw the glass away and stood up. You stupid bitch! You're not worth it! He said later on that he didn't want to make a sin in public, but I knew the real reason he'd stopped. He'd realized that he couldn't make any more money from me with my face all torn up. Irana! Irana! After that, I saw little of Dimitrios, and he often left Sofia for days at a time. But then, Who's that? one night, I was woken by the sound of his voice. Quickly, Irana, over here! I went to the window and drew back the curtains. He was outside on the fire escape, so I let him in. I'm in trouble, Irana. Serious trouble. If anyone asks, I've been here for the last three days. Do you understand? What's happened? Do you understand? I said that I did. I'd never seen him so agitated. And he looked as though he'd been traveling all night. Fetch me a cigarette. I need money, too. I've got to get away. You've had all my money. Well, what about the thousand French francs you've got sewn in the curtains? The ones you think I don't know about. Not my savings, Demetrius. Please. It's only a loan. When I get what I'm owed, I'll pay you back. With interest. It wasn't until later that day that I read about the attempt on the life of Stamboliski. I knew then what Demetrius had got himself involved with. And I knew just as surely that he wouldn't return. Thank you, Madame Provaza. We appreciate your candor. I take it you never heard from Demetrius again? No, Monsieur. Although... Yes? Perhaps I shouldn't say. It frightened me so. Who did? Demetrius? No. Another man. He visited me after Demetrius had left. Who was he? I don't know, some sort of businessman, I think. He was expensively dressed, but very stern, very severe. Oh? He told me that I could expect to be interviewed by the police, but he said that if I provided Demetrius with an alibi, he would pay me 5,000 lever. Did he say who he was? He wasn't the sort to give a name, but I had seen him once or twice before with Demetrius, and... Demetrius wasn't always so discreet. Vasov. That was it. Anton Vasov. Anton Vasov? You know him? No, but I know of him. He was once a director of the Eurasian Credit Trust. It seems you were right, Marakakis. Demetrius was working for that bank. Of course. It would be interesting to know how they first recruited him, would it not? But I don't suppose we ever shall. Perhaps I'll find out more in Belgrade. That's where he went from Sofia. <laughs> I do admire you, Mr. Latimer. Most men would have given up by now. I know they would. But somehow I have to see this thing through to the end. Good luck in Belgrade, then. And be sure to let me know what you discover. I promised I would, and went up the steps to my hotel. But, as it turned out, I was never to reach Belgrade. Good evening, Mr. Latimer. Do please come in. If I was surprised at finding the light on in my room, I was positively astonished to discover Mr. Peters 
The fat man from the train, standing amidst a chaotic pile of my belongings, all of which he appeared to have searched. I must apologize for the mess, but I wasn't expecting you back so soon. Evidently, the girls at your maison close were a little disappointing. He smiled at me sympathetically and leveled a gun at my heart. If you reach out with your left arm, you'll find you can close the door without moving your feet. Now look here. The door, Mr. Latimer. Thank you. And now, perhaps, you'd have the goodness to explain yourself. I beg your pardon? That note of indignation, it's perfect. Quite perfect. But not, if I may say so, entirely convincing. No, no. Don't touch the bell push. We both know, do we not, that there is only one reason why I should search your room. Demetrius. Demetrius? Yes, Mr. Latimer, you examined his file in Athens. And here in Sofia, you've done the same thing. Why is that? What, if I may put it so crudely, is your game? You seem remarkably well informed of my movements. As must be apparent by now, anyone with an interest in Demetrius is also of interest to me. The peculiar-looking gentleman in the Athens Records Bureau. The one the official commented on. I take it that was you. And I don't suppose it was a coincidence that we both shared the same train to Sofia? <laughs> of course not, Mr. Latimer. I have made it my business to know everything you've done since you left Athens. Was it really necessary to destroy my property as well? Look what you've done to my books. They're in pieces. Oh, a tragic act of vandalism, I agree. Books are such lovely things, are they not? He reached into his overcoat pocket and took out a sheet of paper. But when I found this hidden inside one of them, I wondered what else I might find in the bindings. It was the bold summary of events that I'd written on the ferry. Athens, Sofia, quite a list. Would I be correct in thinking that you'll next be visiting Belgrade? Now listen here. I'm tired and I'm cold and I want to go to bed. If you expect me to start answering your questions, then you can answer some of mine. What's the connection between you and Demetrius, for instance? Did you know him? Were you friends? Dear me, you're not very sure of yourself, are you? Perhaps I was mistaken coming here at all. He tucked away his pistol and reached for his hat. I have an idea that I could tell you a good deal more than you can tell me. If it is money you're after, then you're wasting your time. I saw his body in the mortuary at Istanbul, and his entire estate comprised a single bundle of tatty clothing. What was that? Mr. Peters was walking towards the door when he suddenly froze. Say that again. A single bundle of tatty clothing? No, no, before that, you said you saw his body. Yes. What of it? This won't do, Mr. Latimer. This really won't do. If we're to form an alliance, we must stop this silly squabbling. F form an alliance? What the devil are you talking about? You may not realize it, but you're in possession of a very important piece of information. Are you a rich man? Of course not. I'm a writer. Then perhaps the great one, in his boundless generosity, has brought us together for a reason. Your information on its own is almost entirely without value. Combine it with certain facts of which I'm aware, however, and it could easily make us a million French francs. A million? Is that so? You sound sceptical, and I can't say I blame you. But my intentions towards you are purely benign. Perhaps, if I may have a pen and some paper, you'll permit me to demonstrate. I nodded wearily towards the little escritoire in the corner. And Mr. Peters went over and started to write. We both know that you're planning a visit to Belgrade in the hope of learning more about Demetrius. Well, Mr. Latimer, I can spare you the effort. You won't find out a single thing about him in that fair city, not one. If you want to know what he was up to at the time, you must speak to Vladislav Grodek. Vladislav Grodek? Before he retired, he was the most active spy master in Europe. A charming man in his way and a great lover of animals. He lives near Geneva now. The little chair in front of the writing desk creaked as Mr. Peters got up. He walked slowly towards me, goodwill oozing from him like sweat. Here are three pieces of paper. The first is Grodick's address. The second is a letter of introduction. Thank you. And the third? I think you said you were not a rich man. No. I'm not. Then after you've tired of Geneva, you must come to Paris. 
If you contact me when you arrive, I guarantee that within a few short days you will have a half a million French francs to pay into your account. Half a million francs for doing what? Why must you be so mysterious all the time? I can't say no more at present, but if you trust me and come to Paris, send a pneumatique to the address on this third piece of paper. As soon as I receive it, I will come and find you and everything will be explained. I don't know, Mr. Peters. I really don't know. It's far from certain that I shall even bother going to Geneva. And, and as for Paris... Of course, Mr. Latimer, I quite understand. But if you should come, don't forget that pneumatique. I'll think it over. I promise. But I really must sleep. In that case, I'll bid you good night. Not goodbye, Mr. Latimer. Merely good night. He held out his hand. It was dry and very soft. Half a million francs would buy a lot of nice things, would it not? I do hope we shall meet again soon. In Paris. When I woke the following morning, I saw Mr. Peter's three pieces of paper on my bedside table. They were an unpleasant reminder that I had a decision to make. Should I travel all the way to Geneva just on his say-so? And then on to Paris? Or should I cut my losses and go back home? The thought of returning to the quiet, contemplative life of a writer was certainly tempting. But could I simply walk away when so many questions were still unanswered? No, I decided I could not. When the night train left for Geneva that evening, I was on board. I could not have realized it at the time, but I was about to embark on the most dangerous week of my life. Episode 1 of The Mask of Demetrius by Eric Ambler was dramatized by Stephen Sheridan with original music by Neil Brand. Latimer was Jamie Glover, Demetrius, Tim McInerney, Colonel Harkey, Kenneth Cranham, Mr. Peters, Desmond Barrett, Marukakis, Richard Attlee, Irana Privaza, Rachel Atkins, Siantos, Andrew Branch, Sholem, John Evitz, Dries Mohamed, Gary Carr, and the mortuary attendant, Ilka Kaleli. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The Mask of Demetrius is a peer production for BBC Radio 4, directed by David Blount. Demetrius Macropolis was a violent man and he met a violent end. Stabbed and thrown in the Bosphorus, he went to his grave unmourned and should have been forgotten. So varied were his crimes, however, and so strange was his career that I decided in the autumn of 1938 to find out more about him. What began in Istanbul as little more than an academic inquiry had, by the time I reached Geneva, transformed itself into an obsession and an obsession, as I was about to discover, can be a dangerous thing. The Mask of Demetrius by Eric Ambler, dramatized for radio by Stephen Sheridan. Episode two, The House of the Eight Angels. I had been persuaded to visit Geneva by Mr. Peters, a large man with a larger personality, he'd written me a letter of introduction to Vladislav Grodek, a retired spymaster for whom Demetrius had once worked. Three days had passed since I'd sent it, however, and as I sat picking unenthusiastically at a grapefruit in the dining room of my hotel, I wondered if I'd ever hear back. Excuse me, Mr. Latimer, I'm sorry to bother you. I looked up as the hotel manager approached my table. The morning post has just arrived and this came for you. Thank you. I took it from him and tore open the envelope. At last, I had my reply. My dear Mr. Latimer, Grodek's letter began, please join me for luncheon at my villa tomorrow. Unless I hear to the contrary, my chauffeur will collect you at 11 o'clock. Espionage was clearly a lucrative business. The car which brought me to Grodek's villa must have cost many times my annual income, and the study into which I was shown by his housekeeper was the size of a small church. 
Make yourself comfortable, Mr. Latimer. Thank you. I'm sure Herr Grodek won't be long. I was about to settle into one of the armchairs by the fire when a Siamese cat jumped onto the back and stared at me with hostile blue eyes. It was immediately joined by another whose expression was no less unfriendly. I see you've met Antoine and Simone. I turned around as Grodek entered the room. Delightful, aren't you, mes enfants? <laughs> and so much more intelligent than most of the people I know. In his carpet slippers and baggy tweeds, there was more of the retired bank manager about him than the retired spy. I'm afraid the autumn weather makes them ill-tempered, though. Do you like English whiskey? Very much. Good. I, too, prefer it as an aperitif. <clears throat> I'm not sure if Mr. Peters explained the purpose of my visit in his letter of introduction. I didn't read it myself, because... First because it was written in Polish, and I don't suppose you're familiar with my native tongue. Your health, Mr. Latimer. And yours. He said you wanted to know about my work with Demetrius in Belgrade. Is that correct? Yes. He also said that you were a writer of detective stories. That would explain your interest in Demetrius, I suppose. But something bothers me. Oh? Peters is a clever man, but mercenary. He wouldn't send you to me unless he thought he could benefit from it in some way. Would you care to describe to me the nature of your relationship? I only wish I could, but I'm not sure I really understand it myself. Please, monsieur, I'm not joking. Neither am I. We first came across each other whilst I was conducting my investigations in Athens. He then followed me to Sofia, where he questioned me at gunpoint. At gunpoint? Yes. He followed this up with an offer. He said that if I would meet him in Paris and collaborate with him in some scheme he had in mind, we would both profit to the extent of half a million francs. Hmm. He claimed I was in possession of a very valuable piece of information. Did you believe him? Not at first. That's when he gave me your address as a token of goodwill. He told me you could help with my research. I don't wish to seem too inquisitive, monsieur, but what is the valuable piece of information you possess? I don't know. Oh, come now. If you want me to confide in you, then surely you can return the compliment. I'm telling you the truth, Herr Grodek. I don't know. Peters and I talked together fairly freely. Then, at a particular point in the conversation, he began to grow excited. At what point? It was when I explained to him how I knew that Demetrius was penniless when he died. I see. And how did you know? I saw his body in Istanbul. All his worldly goods had been piled up alongside him on the mortuary table, and they comprised nothing more than a tatty set of old clothing. Thank you, Mr. Latimer. That is very helpful. Grodek stared at me for several seconds. Then he walked to the drinks cabinet and poured us two more whiskies. To my surprise, I saw he was laughing. <laughs> oh, forgive me, but it was the thought of Peters holding you at gunpoint. He's quite terrified of firearms, you know. He managed to keep his fears to himself most successfully. Oh, dear, I'm afraid I've upset you, but don't be downhearted. He clapped me on the shoulder. He suddenly seemed in excellent spirits. After we've eaten, I'll tell you all about Demetrius and the trouble he caused me in 1926. But first, may I be permitted to offer you a word of advice? Please do. If I were you, I'd be inclined to take our friend Peters at his word and go to Paris. I've a feeling it may prove very much to your advantage. After an excellent luncheon, we returned to the study. Grodek poured us two more whiskies and began to talk. Espionage can be challenging work. If I were to ask you to acquire a chart showing the positions of Yugoslavia's coastal minefields, where would you start? Was that your mission in 1926? Yes. The Italian government hired me to obtain a copy in case tensions between the two countries increased. I'm not sure where I'd start, but then I'm not a spy. Within a week of setting up house in Belgrade, I had managed to discover that the chart was being held under lock and key at the Ministry of Marine. So what did you do? Break in and copy it? I see you favour the direct approach. But no, Mr. Latimer. If the Yugoslavs had any reason to suspect their chart had been examined, they would simply have repositioned their minds. I blushed a little at my own naivety. 
Thanks to Demetrius, they found out anyway. But I shall come to that part of my story by and by. How did you obtain a copy of the chart, then? The answer is simple, Mr. Latimer. I didn't. Oh? I let someone else obtain it for me. I'm not sure I follow, Herr Grodek. I kept a close eye on the Ministry of Marine, watching the comings and goings of its staff. I was looking for a very particular type of person, and on the third day, I found him. Shabby, middle-aged, careworn, he was perfect. Absolutely perfect. A brandy, please. J just a small one. My wife's cut my allowance. He was in the habit of visiting the Café Milosha after work for a drink, and I learned from the other customers that he was a junior clerk. It must have been humiliating at his age still to hold so lowly a position, and I saw the failure in his eyes when I approached him one evening and asked for a light. Oh, I see you favor cigars, monsieur. I also prefer them to cigarettes. Oh, these are from Cuba. Would you like one? Oh, thank you, monsieur. And Bullich, by the way. Walter Bullich. During the next few days, I often drank with her Bullich, and sometimes I allowed him to beat me at cards. When he asked me what I did for a living, I told him I was a representative of a German optical company. Well, that must be interesting work. But what, may I ask, brings you to Belgrade? My company has submitted a quotation for binoculars to the Ministry of Marine. Oh, I expect you know that already, though. I hear you're one of their most important men. Oh, really, monsieur? You, you flatter me. Not at all. In fact, now I come to think of it... Yes? No, no. Forget I even spoke. No, no. Please, monsieur, tell me. It's nothing, really. But my company could do with a friend at court... If you were to use your influence to help us to secure the contract I mentioned, we'd be more than happy to cover your expenses. Would 20,000 dinar be enough? 20,000 dinar? He thought it over. He knew, of course, that as a lowly clerk he had no influence whatsoever. But he also knew that he could easily take the credit if, by some chance, my company should win the contract anyway. You understand, of course, that I can't make any promises. I saw at once that my fish was caught. But as you've been so very kind, I, I'll see what I can do. Thank you, Herr Bullich. That's all I ask. And I dare say some extra money would be useful. But my wife has expensive tastes. And the ministry pays less well than you might imagine. Yes, monsieur, some extra money would be very useful indeed. A week later, the contract was awarded to a Czech firm. Bulich stopped coming to the cafe for a few days, and when I saw him again, he looked awkward and uncomfortable. I'm sorry, monsieur. I, I assure you, I did my best. What are you talking about? I couldn't be happier with the outcome. Here's the 20,000 dinar I promised you. I... I, I don't understand. Surely your company lost the contract. <laughs> lost it? Didn't I explain? We submitted our quotation through one of our Czech subsidiaries. What, you, you mean... Oh, but that is wonderful. We must celebrate. I know a splendid place just around the corner. Go home and change and meet me there in an hour. And make sure you bring your excellent wife. This champagne is delicious, monsieur. I love the way it tickles. <laughs> May I have some more? Oh, now, now, Anna. No, I think you've had too much already. Oh, my husband is such a nuisance. He hates to see me having fun. He's an important man. He has to consider his position. Him? <laughs> important? I think you've had too much as well. Look, Herr Woolwich, over there. Who is that? A friend of mine from Germany. He's just come in. Would you have any objection to him joining us? None whatsoever. He's rather dashing. I beckoned him over and introduced him as the Baron von Kiesling. It's an honor to make your acquaintance, sir. But needless to say, he was better known by another name. I assure you, mein Herr, the honor is mine. Demetrius. I take it he was always part of your plan. 
how did you first come to hear of him? He was recommended by an acquaintance of mine. I can say no more than that. He was calling himself Demetrius Talat at the time and had a reputation for efficiency and discretion. The acquaintance who recommended him, did he by any chance work for a bank called the Eurasian Credit Trust? Yes, Mr. Latimer, he did. But how on earth... I heard about the Eurasian Credit Trust when I was in Sofia. They hired Demetrius to assassinate a politician. But please, Herr Grodek, do carry on with your story. After the introductions were over, Demetrius went to work in earnest. How witty her Bullich was, how charming his wife. They must come and stay with him at his house in Bavaria. Or would they prefer Paris or Cannes? By the time he asked Madame Bullich to dance with him, they were both entirely smitten. The Baron is most agreeable, Monsieur. I mean, most agreeable. And clearly very wealthy. Very. I'm told he owns no fewer than 27 companies. What? You'd do well to cultivate his friendship. Really? Think so? Bullich's eyes glazed over as he no doubt imagined himself running one of the Baron's companies, barking out orders to his put upon staff. You dance divinely, Baron von Kistling. <laughs> Thank you. I was fortunate to have so graceful a partner. <laughs> Girl! He called over a flower seller and bought Madame Bullich an orchid. As he opened his wallet to pay for it, a large wad of thousand dinar notes fell onto the table. Oh! You shouldn't carry so much money, my friend. It isn't safe. I valued that Alessandro's earlier and forgot to put it away in my room. Do you know Alessandro's, madam? Oh, I don't think so. It's the luckiest gambling place in Belgrade. Would you care to join me there as my guest after we've dined? <sighs> We'd be delighted, wouldn't we, Walter? Of course we would, dear. <laughs> delighted. <laughs> naturally, they were expected, and naturally, preparations had been made. We decided against roulette. It's too hard to cheat a man at roulette, but there were plenty of other games with which to ensnare them. Well done, monsieur, well done. I played first and won 2,000 dinar at 30 et 40. Demetrius played next and did even better. I told you this was a lucky place. Would you care to play a little hair bullet? Oh, oh, no, I, I'm not really sure. Oh, go on. Don't show yourself up in front of the baron. I, I'm afraid I, I didn't think to bring much money with me. That's no problem. Alessandro! He called over the proprietor, who, I need hardly add, also worked for me. Would it be possible to extend a line of credit to Herr Bulic? I'm more than happy to vouch for it. All that won't be necessary, Herr Baron. I know I can always trust your friends. Bulic borrowed 5,000 dinar and started to play. We let him win a little on couleur. Yes! <laughs> then took it away again on inverse. Oh. In less than an hour, all his chips had gone. Bad luck, old man. Here, play with some of mine. If Bullich thought the chips were a gift, he was to discover later on they were not. He played again and lost again, and hoping for a change in fortune, borrowed some more. At the end of the evening, pale and sweating, he had to sign a promissory note for 12,000 dinar. Never mind, Herr Bullich. I dare say you'll win it all back tomorrow. And no doubt, a great deal more besides. A professional gambler knows when to cut his losses, but Bulich was not a professional. He returned the following night with the 20,000 dinar I had paid him, redeemed his promissory note to Alessandro, and spent the rest on 500 dinar chips. A drink before you start, Herr Bulic. Uh, no, thank you. I, I want to keep a clear head. Inevitably, he lost and lost again. Then he began once more to borrow. I don't think he ever suspected he was being cheated. <laughs> Why would he? But by the end of the evening, he owed 37,000 dinar more than he had in the world. I'm sorry that the cars didn't favor you tonight, Herr Bulic. Uh, may I ask when you'll be able to pay off for your debt? Soon, Alessandro. Soon. From then on, it was plain sailing. Bulic came to me for money the following day. 
With many soft words and expressions of regret, I refused him and suggested he try the baron instead. I was hiding in an adjoining bedroom when Demetrius opened the door of his hotel suite and I was able to hear all that followed. Come in, Herr Bullich. You don't look well. Uh, I did not sleep much and uh, my wife was on at me all day. Um, I, I, I was just wondering. Yes? Um, what would happen if I were unable to pay back Alessandro. <laughs> I hope there's no question of that. He was only willing to extend your credit on my recommendation. I, I know, I, I know, but, but un unless you can see your way to making me a loan. It's out of the question. You already owe me 5,000 dinar for the chips I lent you the other night. Well, what am I to do then? I, I, I could lose my job over this or even go to prison. Stop panicking. I said I wouldn't make you alone. I didn't say I wouldn't help. Oh. A friend of mine requires something from the Ministry of Marine. He'd be willing to pay you 50,000 dinar for it. 50,000? Well, what does he want? The chart showing the location of Yugoslavia's coastal minefields. So... That's your game, is it? No, Herr Baron, never. I won't work for a filthy spy. Shut up! Oh, no, no, please, please, no. Please don't hit me. You've seen the chart. You know that's kept. Well, yes, yes, I... I work in the department, but I'm just a humble clerk. So much the better. No one will have a cause to suspect you. Bring the chart here tomorrow night. You can have it back an hour later and replace it in the morning. But... But the risks, Herr Baron, the risks. There's only one risk you need worry about. And that's not doing exactly as I say. Poor Bulic. He wasn't the kind to stand up to intimidation, and Demetrius could be very menacing. He returned the following evening with the chart folded in four under his coat. Demetrius brought it to me in the adjoining bedroom and watched as I photographed it and developed the negative. What shall I do with him now? Pay him? Of course. Make sure he knows what will happen, though, if he goes to the police. Uh, I'll put the fear of God into him. Don't worry about that. I was holding the negative up to the light when Demetrius came back. I've come for my wages. Oh, yes, of course. I'll fetch them from my house. I'm not talking about those wages. I'm talking about the ones you've got in your hand. <laughs> I looked down and saw that he'd taken out a pistol. It's not just the Italians who want a copy of that chart, you see. I've been talking to some people in France. He jammed the pistol into my stomach and snatched away the negative. <coughs> Thank you, Herr Grodek. He smiled at me coldly and took a step back. As you've been so helpful, I think I'll let you live. Demetrius didn't make many mistakes, Mr. Latimer, but he was foolish not to kill me. When I failed to locate him, I contacted the Yugoslav authorities and told them that their security had been breached. What? After all that work? What else could I do? It was a bitter pill to swallow, but I couldn't permit Demetrius to profit from cheating me. And Herr Bulic? What became of him? He was arrested and put on trial. Very wisely, he told all he knew and spared himself a firing squad. I believe he's still in prison, though. Another ruined life. Another victim of Demetrius. Surely there can't be much more left for you to learn about him. No, Herr Grodek. One more piece and my jigsaw's done. I think it's time I spoke with Mr. Peters again. I arrived in Paris on a slate grey November morning. As my taxi crossed the bridge to the Ile de la Cité, I saw a panorama of low black clouds moving quickly in the chill, dusty wind. After I'd unpacked, I sent a pneumatique to Mr. Peters, giving him the address of my hotel. Then I typed out a letter to Marakakis, the Greek journalist I'd befriended in Sofia, telling him all that had subsequently happened. I'd finished by noon, and decided to while away a few hours in the cuttings library of a local newspaper. By the time I left it, 
I knew a great deal more than I'd expected. Good evening, Mr. Latimer. How very glad I am to see you again. Mr. Peters came to my hotel room at a little after six. The last time we'd encountered each other, he'd taken me by surprise. This time I was ready for him. I do hope Herr Grodek was of some use. He's a charming fellow, is he not? And those cats of his... He was very helpful, Mr. Peters. Have you brought your pistol with you? Dear me, no, Mr. Latimer. Why would I bring a pistol to a friendly meeting? And why, may I ask, are you locking the door? I hate to seem like a bad host, but there are one or two things you should know. Firstly, I'm not by nature a violent man, but unless you tell me what you want with me, I shan't be answerable for my actions. I see. And secondly? Secondly, your name is not Peters. It's Paterson, and you're a Danish national. Uh. You were part of a drug smuggling gang set up by Demetrius, and in 1931 you were arrested, fined, and sent to prison. Did Grodek tell you this? No. I spent the afternoon in a cuttings library. I was hoping to find out more about the time Demetrius spent in Paris, but instead I saw a picture of you. The one where I'm leaving court in handcuffs, no doubt. Not very flattering, is it? You don't deny it, then? Deny it? Of course not. It's true. Very well, then, Mr. Paterson. Please. I prefer Peters. As you wish, Mr. Peters. When I was in Istanbul, I heard some interesting things about the end of your gang. It was said that Demetrius betrayed the lot of you by sending an incriminating dossier to the police. That was very wrong of him, and very cruel. But I'm afraid he'd started taking his own product by then, and drug addicts have a reputation for treachery. It was also said that several of you threatened to kill him when you left prison. Is that true? One or two of us did, certainly. Marnus Visser, in particular, was very vocal on the subject. But then he always had been something of a hothead. And what about you? Did you threaten to kill him, too? Or did you go further? My dear Mr. Latimer, will you please come to the point? You were in the Levant when Demetrius was murdered. What would you say if I accused you of committing the crime and killing him for his money? I'd say you were being very indiscreet and very unwise. Supposing I had killed him as you suggest, I'd now have no choice but to kill you, too. He reached into his overcoat and took out his pistol. You see, I lied about being unarmed. I wanted to know how you'd behave if you thought I was helpless. All of which is as skillful a reply to an accusation of murder as one could wish for. Please, Mr. Latimer. He wearily returned his pistol to his overcoat pocket. If you cannot be discreet, at least use your imagination. Is it likely that Demetrius would make a will in my favour? No. Then how do you suppose I could kill him for his money? I had to concede that he had a point. His capacity for making me feel foolish was quite phenomenal. May I suggest we try being sensible instead? Let us have dinner together, then talk business back at my apartment. Very well. But I warn you now. Unless I get a satisfactory explanation of why you brought me to Paris, I shall, half a million francs or not, leave by the first available train. Is that clear? Perfectly clear. And may I say how much I appreciate your frankness. I only wish the Great One could teach us all to be so candid, so honest, so trusting of our fellow man. Quite so. At Mr. Peter's suggestion, and at Mr. Peter's expense... We dined at a cheap restaurant in the Rue Jacob. Then we went back to the Impasse des Huitanges, a narrow alleyway comprising three houses, all but one of which appeared to be empty. This way. I'm afraid my apartment is right at the top. The stairs creaked under his weight as he began to climb. Following on behind, I was irresistibly reminded of a circus elephant reluctantly picking its way up a pyramid of coloured blocks to perform a balancing trick. We used to use all three houses in the Ampass for storage. Strictly speaking, they belonged to Demetrius, but he took the precaution of buying them in my name. And Monsieur Caille? I'm sorry? I noticed a little brass plaque by the front door. It said that the top floor apartment was owned by a Monsieur Caille. How very observant of you. Monsieur Caille doesn't exist. Oh? I wanted Demetrius to think I'd sell the houses. So I adopted the name of Kaihe and bought them from myself. Mr. Peters was sweating heavily by the time we reached the top floor. 
He stood panting for a moment outside a battered front door and fumbled in his pocket for a key. Thought we might have some Algerian coffee. It takes longer to prepare than French, but I prefer it. Shall we go in? Mr. Peter's apartment had all the understated elegance of a Christmas grotto. It was divided up by cheap-looking gold curtains. There were thick Moroccan rugs on the floor, a large brass gong in the corner, and two battered leather ottomans piled high with bright purple cushions. An oasis of rest in a desert of turmoil. I do hope you like it. Whilst Mr. Peters busied himself making coffee, I went and sat down on one of the ottomans. There were two books on the little table in front of it, an unopened copy of Plato's Symposium and a volume of erotic poetry that looked very well thumbed. There was also a photograph. Do you recognize the man in that picture? Of course I do. It's Demetrius. I keep it as a souvenir of the old days. We used to hold meetings in here, you know. He placed the coffee percolator on a tray and brought it over with two cups and a box of cigarettes. The Great One has bestowed upon me an excellent memory. And if I close my eyes, I can still picture us all together. Myself and Demetrius, Werner the chemist, and Marnus Visser, of course. You mentioned Marnus Visser earlier. You said he was a hothead. And so he was. Violent, angry, hard to control. He only died quite recently. Oh, but of course, you know about that already. I beg your pardon? I don't know anything of the sort. Well, that photograph you just looked at. The one of Demetrius? What about it? That isn't Demetrius, Mr. Latimer. It's Marnus Visser. What are you talking about? Don't be absurd. That, that's the man I saw lying on a mortuary table in Istanbul. Precisely. Marnus Visser. No. It was Demetrius I saw. Demetrius. No, Mr. Latimer. It was Marnus Visser after Demetrius had killed him. Demetrius himself, I'm delighted to say, is still very much alive and in excellent health. Now, how would you like your coffee? I knew, as much by instinct as by reason, that Mr. Peters had told me the truth. The implications of what he'd said were so horrendous, however, that all I could do was sit there and gape. Tell me, Mr. Latimer, how did the Turkish police identify the body? I'm sorry? The body, Mr. Latimer, how did they identify it? There was a French identity card sewn into the clothing. Was there indeed? That's almost amusing. I could get you a dozen such cards, all in the name of Demetrius Macropolis, for little more than a few francs. If Demetrius is still alive, then where is he? Here in Paris. I saw him just the other day. What? Don't look so worried. I made sure he didn't see me. You haven't touched your coffee. <laughs> Never mind my coffee. I, I want to know how Manus Visser ended up dead instead of Demetrius. Of course you do. And as you've been so very patient, I shall tell you. He took a cigarette from the box and lit it. Prison affects men in different ways. After I was released, I purged my heart of malice and went abroad. Visser would have done well to follow my example, but he was hell-bent on revenge. Yes. You said. He eventually found Demetrius living in a large house under an assumed name. Demetrius had cured himself of his drug addiction by then and become a man of some wealth and influence. I think Visser intended to kill him at first, but his greed got the better of him, and he turned to extortion instead. How do you know all this? Did Visser tell you? Yes, Mr. Latimer. The Great One contrived for us to meet quite by chance in a restaurant. When I heard how much Demetrius was paying him to keep quiet, I admit it surprised me. And then I started to think. Oh? If Demetrius was willing to pay so much to a man who knew so little, how much more would he pay to a man who knew it all? That's when I decided to find out more about him. And that's what brought you to the Athens Records Bureau at the same time as me? Precisely. It was in Athens that I read about the so-called murder of Demetrius. I knew it wasn't him they dragged from the Bosphorus, though. Visser had written to me a few weeks earlier, boasting that Demetrius had invited him on an Aegean cruise, and I'd realised at once what was planned. Demetrius must have killed him. 
hidden the identity card inside his clothing and thrown him overboard. I take it the Turkish authorities still wanted Demetrius in connection with some crime or other? Yes. The murder of an old moneylender named Sholem. You see how economical he was? In one fell swoop, he rid himself of a dangerous enemy and closed the book on one of his past misdemeanors. Poor Vissa. I almost feel sorry for him. So do I. But we mustn't be sentimental, must we? After all, his death has provided us with a useful opportunity. Shall we go for a walk, Mr. Latimer? Oh, I especially like the Seine by moonlight. By the time we reached the Pont Neuf, the cold night air had cleared my head. Mr. Peters stood looking down at the water, apparently lost in thought. It must be a terrible thing to drown. I only hope that Visser was dead before he was thrown in the Bosphorus. He wasn't a good man, but I shouldn't like to think that he suffered at the last. I thought we'd agreed not to be sentimental. You still haven't told me the details of your plan. Come along now. Isn't it obvious? You know and can prove that the man buried in Istanbul isn't Demetrius. I, on the other hand, know what he's calling himself nowadays and where he can be found. Together, we can make him pay handsomely to keep what we know to ourselves. Just a minute. Surely you're not suggesting we blackmail him? Not after what happened to Vissa. Vissa was greedy. That was his downfall. We shall be more circumspect. Demetrius won't be prepared for that. Oh? We shall simply ask him for one million francs. He'll pay up thinking he can kill us when we come back for more. But we shan't come back for more. We shall rest content with half a million each and quietly disappear. I don't understand why you need to involve me, though. Couldn't you simply blackmail him on your own? Demetrius knows nothing about you, Mr. Latimer, and that makes you dangerous. He will have to pay or run an unknown risk. Peters reached into his overcoat and took out a single sheet of paper. I have taken the liberty of preparing a letter for him. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to offer your professional opinion? I took the letter and read it under one of the lamps that lined the Pont Neuf. Its tone was gratifyingly similar to a blackmail note I'd once written in one of my novels. Well, Mr. Latimer, what do you think? I think, Mr. Peters, that I'd be well advised to go to the police and tell them what I know. Which is what? That a criminal from a faraway land isn't as dead as everyone thinks. They'd want to know what he's taken to calling himself and where they might find him. He was, of course, right. There was nothing I could do to bring Demetrius to justice. I could either pack my bags and go home, or stay, and see things through to the end. The former was unthinkable, so that left the latter. It's getting cold. Have you made a decision? Yes. I'll do what you want, but I have some conditions. I hope it's not about the money. Half a million is generous. Too generous. I don't want a penny of it. Huh? My first condition is that you keep it all for yourself. I have no objection to blackmailing a man if that man is Demetrius, but I prefer not to share in the profits. I see. And your second condition? You won't find it any more onerous than the first. I want to know what sort of racket Demetrius is involved in nowadays. The most lucrative of all. Banking. You mean... Precisely. He's currently a director of the Eurasian Credit Trust. I arranged to meet Mr. Peters at the Café Houseman in two days' time. He was already there when I arrived, a raspberry liqueur in front of him and a suitcase at his side. Good evening, Mr. Latimer. I trust you're keeping well. You look a trifle pale. I wasn't surprised. I'd barely slept during the last 48 hours. I'll finish my liqueur and then we'll be off. Did you send Demetrius that letter? Of course. I told him to meet us tonight at a hotel near the Ledron Rollin Metro. I felt my stomach lurch unpleasantly at the thought and asked Mr. Peters what he had in his suitcase. Old newspapers. It doesn't do to arrive at a hotel without luggage. Well, shall we uh, go? He wiped his lips on a napkin and hauled himself to his feet. We'll get there by taxi, but return on the Metro. Why on the Metro? You'll see. The hotel Mr. Peters had chosen was small and dirty. 
An unshaven man in shirt sleeves came out when we arrived, chewing a mouthful of food. I telephoned earlier for a room. Monsieur Peterson? Uh, yes. It's a large room. Fifteen francs for one, twenty for two. Uh, this gentleman is not staying with me. Fifteen francs, then. Room six. Here's the key. Thank you. A, a friend of mine will be calling here soon. Ask him to come up when he arrives. <laughs> Mr. Peters unlocked the door and ushered me in. It's rather nice in its way. And delightfully cheap. He's due in 20 minutes. We'd better make ourselves comfortable. I don't think I'll ever feel comfortable again. What's to stop him coming in here and shooting us dead? Oh, really, Mr. Latimer, you've seen too many gangster films. He's far too cautious to murder in public. I expect that's what Visser thought. If you're nervous, we'll give you a pseudonym. How about Mr. Smith? That's a good English name. Do you wear spectacles? Only for reading. Put them on. And turn up the collar of your coat. If you go and sit in the corner where it's dark, Demetrius won't be able to see your face. Do you think he'll come? As long as he got our letter, I'm certain of it. We fell silent. In the semi-darkness, I could hear the beating of my heart. Mr. Peters checked his watch. Ten minutes to go. I tried to pass the time as best I could by counting the red squared patterns of the wallpaper. The sound of someone walking about in the room upstairs seemed to intensify the silence. Five minutes. Then, so suddenly that it seemed as loud as a pistol shot, one of the stairs outside the door creaked. He's here. There was a soft knock. Mr. Peters went to the door and opened it. He stared for a moment into the shadows of the landing. Then he stood back, and Demetrius came in. Good evening, Peterson. I'm not quite sure what I've been expecting. A man who somehow exuded corruption, perhaps. But with his dark, neat clothes, his slim, erect figure, and his sleek, grey hair, he could not have looked more respectable. Aren't you going to introduce me to your friend? I don't think we've met. This is Mr. Smith, Demetrius. The gentleman you mentioned in your letter. I understand you knew Manus Visser, monsieur. I saw Manus Visser. That's what we're here to discuss. Be quick about it, then. I have an appointment. You haven't changed. You're still impetuous, still unkind. And you still talk too much. Tell me what you want. Very well, then. As you insist on getting straight down to business, we want money. Naturally. And what do I get in return? Our silence. It's very valuable. How valuable? By my reckoning, it's worth at least a million francs. And I'm going to pay you that for it, am I? Yes, Demetrius, you are. Otherwise, we might have to tell the police that a highly respected director of the Eurasian Credit Trust once made his living from trafficking drugs. <laughs> Is that the best you can do? My God, you're childish. No doubt I am. You always were inclined to mock my simple approach to life's problems. There was a look of viciousness on Mr. Peter's face that I'd never seen there before. Perhaps we might also contact the authorities in Yugoslavia. I'm sure they'd be interested in the whereabouts of Demetrius Talat. So you've been talking to Grodek too, have you? Not a sou for that either, my friend. What else do you have? Athens, 1922. Does that mean anything to you? The name was Taladis, if you remember, and the charge was robbery and attempted murder. You see how thorough we've been? Demetrius stared straight ahead, expressionless. Mr. Smith has already told you that he saw poor Visser. It was in a mortuary in Istanbul. He's very friendly with the Turkish police, and they showed him the body. Still, Demetrius didn't move. Think how surprised they'd be to learn that the murderer of Sholem, the moneylender, is still alive and not mouldering in his grave as they thought. The murderer of Sholem was hanged. Was he? Surely that can't be right. Can it, Mr. Smith? No. A man named Dries Mohammed was hanged for the crime, but he made a confession implicating Monsieur Macropolis. A warrant was issued for his arrest and is, I believe, still active. No doubt the authorities in Athens would also like to know that you're still alive, Demetrius. And those in Sofia. Does a million still seem too much? I'm wondering why you don't want more. Well, we may come back again from time to time, but don't worry. You'll not find us greedy. I hope not. It wouldn't be wise to make me desperate. 
You're to give us the million tomorrow in thousand franc notes. So soon? You'll receive written instructions on how to pay in the morning post. If you deviate from them in any way, you won't be given a second chance. Do you understand? Perfectly. The words were spoken levelly enough, but as Demetrius moved to the door, a thought seemed to occur to him. Tell me, Mr. Smith, how was this man you took for this address? In a cheap serge suit. A French identity card was sewn into the lining of his overcoat. And how was he killed? He'd been stabbed in the stomach and thrown into the sea. Are you satisfied, Demetrius? Hmm? Good. You will receive your instructions in the morning. Demetrius left without another word. Mr. Peters shut the door behind him, waited a moment or two, then gently opened it again and looked out into the hallway. He's gone. What did you make of him? I'm not sure. But I hadn't realized you hated him so much. I hadn't realized it myself. I didn't like him, of course. I didn't trust him. After the way he betrayed us all, that's hardly surprising. But it wasn't until he stepped into this room that something became clear to me. What? I hated him quite enough to kill him. We went downstairs a few minutes later and out into the street. May I ask you a question, Mr. Latimer? Was it the thought that I might betray you to Demetrius that made you refuse your half of the money? No, of course not. Good. I shouldn't like to think you thought so little of me. We're almost at the Metro. Why at the Metro? You still haven't explained. Don't you notice? We're being followed. No, don't turn round. A young man in a grey hat. I knew Demetrius would try something of the sort. What are we going to do? Down the steps of the Metro. That's it. Walk as quickly as you can, but don't run. And make sure you stay close to me. Mr. Peters bought us two second-class tickets, and we hurried on down the tunnel towards the trains. When we reached the point where it split in two, we stopped. It would be wise if we appeared to be about to take leave of one another. You see, our pursuers stopped too. He's not sure what's going to happen. A talk to me, please, Mr. Latimer. Talk? But not too loudly. I want to listen. Listen to what? The trains. I spent half an hour here listening to them this morning. What on earth for? I don't see... There's one coming. Quickly, Mr. Latimer. The right-hand tunnel. The train had already pulled into the platform when we arrived, and we leapt on board. Huh. Oh, yes. You see, Mr. Latimer, if you want to lose a man, you can't do better than the Paris Metro. But we weren't safe yet. We could see the young man in the hat running down the tunnel towards us. Slowly, oh, so slowly, the automatic door began to close. He was almost upon us when it shut in his face. As the train began to move, I looked back and saw him standing on the platform, shaking his fists at us in impotent rage. And that, my dear Mr. Latimer, is what I believe you English call a very close shave. <laughs> we changed trains several times and finally got out at Saint Placide. As we walked down the Rue de Rennes, I asked Mr. Peters when he'd be writing Demetrius his letter of instruction. He smiled at me and tapped his pocket. It's already written. The money is to be collected at the junction of the Avenue de la Reine and the Boulevard Jean Jaurès at 11 o'clock tomorrow night. I suppose you'll already have left Paris by then. I don't know. I haven't decided. I shall be sorry to say goodbye to you. Are you sure you won't take even a thousand francs for your expenses? Perfectly sure, thank you. No, of course not. But how about a glass of wine? I'm sorry? I've been thinking. You shouldn't rush home without seeing our collaboration through to its climax. Why not come with me tomorrow night to collect the money? Then we can drink a toast afterwards to our success. You want me to stay in Paris, then? Why not? You deserve the satisfaction of seeing that swine Demetrius squeezed up a little blood. Are you sure you don't want to keep me here in case he calls your bluff? Really, Mr. Latimer? How can you think of such a thing? All right, all right. I'll stay. But the wine we drink afterwards must be champagne. Oh. And a vintage cuvee at that. It will cost you at least a hundred francs. Mr. Peter's eyes opened wide at the thought of such expense. But he managed a brave smile. You shall have it, Mr. Latimer. You shall have it. At a quarter to eleven the following evening, 
we took up our positions at the corner of the Avenue de la Reine. Mr. Peters had sent a hired car to pick up a messenger from Demetrius, and we were eagerly awaiting its arrival. I told the driver to make sure he wasn't followed, so he won't have taken the most direct route. He should be here soon, though. I hope so. It's starting to rain. Look, Mr. Latimer. The car. A large Renault drew slowly to a halt, the rain glistening brightly in the beams of its headlights. Stay here, will you please? I shan't be a moment. He walked towards the car, opened the rear door and leaned in. When he straightened up again, he was holding a paper-wrapped parcel the size of a book. Thank you very much. Uh, wait a moment, please. He walked back and asked me to strike a match. In its dim, flickering light, he tore away a corner of the paper, exposing a thick wad of thousand-franc notes. Beautiful. He raised his hand, and the Renault swung in a wide circle and splashed away on its return journey. The messenger was a woman, and rather a pretty one too, but I'd rather have my million francs. Are you going to count it now? I shall reserve that pleasure for the comfort of my own home. A taxi, I think, and then a glass of your favorite champagne. All in all, I'd say we'd earned it. As soon as we arrived back at his apartment, Mr. Peters threw his overcoat onto one of the leather ottomans and tore open the package. With loving care, he extracted the notes from their wrappings and held them up. A million francs. Have you ever seen so much money in one place? What will you do with it all? Oh, a little trip to South America, perhaps. I haven't decided. But we must have our champagne. You'll find it cooling in a bowl of water on the sideboard. Still holding the money... He went behind me towards the curtained-off part of the room. I'll fetch us some glasses. I went over to the champagne. Mr. Peter's generosity had only extended to a half bottle, but I wasn't surprised. I was trying to open it when I heard him gasp, <gasps> and when I turned round, my blood ran cold. Good evening, Peterson. Or should I say, Monsieur Caillé? Demetrius was emerging from a gap in the curtains a snub-nosed revolver in his hand. Did you really think I wouldn't know you still own these houses? You always were inclined to take me for a fool. It was good of you to bring Mr. Smith with you, though. It saved me the bother of having to persuade you to give me his name and address. Drop the money. No, 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 I said drop it. As the wad of notes hit the carpet... Mr. Peters seemed to realize what was about to happen, and his face grew pale. No, Demetrius, you mustn't. He staggered and fell onto his knees, blood pouring from his neck. And now, my friend, for you. Before he could fire, I jumped forward. My foot caught on one of the thick Moroccan rugs, and I stumbled. The bullet flew harmlessly over my head. Damn you! I leapt at him, knocking the gun from his hand. We struggled. He pushed me off. I threw a chair. It hit his shoulder. We went for the gun. I got there first. And trying not to tremble, I picked it up and aimed it. All right. All right. Enough. He was suddenly very calm and watchful. What are you going to do? If you try to move, I'll shoot you. Really? Think about it, my friend. If you shoot me, you'll only get Peterson's million francs. If you let me go, I'll give you another million as well. Be quiet. Two million, my friend. I said be quiet. Quickly. My overcoat. The pistol. Leaving a trail of blood behind him, Mr. Peters had crawled towards one of the leather ottomans and was leaning against it with his eyes half closed. I'll cover him. You get the police. No! Don't be a fool! The police will be here soon. Someone must have heard the shots. Won't oh, find us. Get police now! If you leave me here with him, he'll kill me. You know that, don't you? Be sensible and take my offer. Ignoring him, I reached into the overcoat on the ottoman and gave Mr. Peters his pistol. Five million, then! Is that enough? Or do you want this carrion to kill me? Don't worry, Peters. I shan't be long. Don't shoot unless you have to. I paused at the door <laughs> and turned to look at him. Oh, it's funny, isn't it? But you're always defeated by stupidity in the end. Sometimes it's your own. Sometimes it's other people's. 
but it always ends the same way. I was no more than halfway down the stairs when I heard the shots ring out. There were two of them, followed a little later by a third. Heedless of my own safety, I turned and ran back to the room. Curiously, the fear uppermost in my mind was for Mr. Peters. What is it? What's happened? Came back. How kind. He was barely breathing, but his fingers were still wrapped around the butt of his pistol. The bullets he'd fired had all found their mark. Two had struck Demetrius in the chest. The third had hit him between the eyes, almost taking off the top of his head. Go now, before the police. You're injured. You need help. Beyond help. Please. You go. I tried to think of something to say, some words of comfort to offer, but it was too late. The Great One had summoned him home. I took his advice and left before the police arrived. It would have been too hard to explain my presence. Your cognac, monsieur? As I sat in a cafe in the Rue de Rennes, I wondered what they'd make of it all. I'd wiped my fingerprints from the revolver that had belonged to Demetrius and placed it in his hand. With no reason to suspect the involvement of a third party, they would no doubt conclude that two criminals had shot each other in a squalid dispute over money. I, alone, would know the truth. The thought of having to keep such knowledge to myself suddenly felt like a terrible burden, and I knew I'd have to share it with someone. But who could I tell? To that question, at least, I had an answer. So, Mr. Latimer, your quest is over at last. I admire you for pursuing it so doggedly. I thanked him for the compliment. Marukakis had impressed me greatly during my first visit to Sofia, and sitting in the office of the newspaper where he worked, I felt glad that I'd come back to see him. It's a pity, though, that it all had to end in violence. At least I have the satisfaction of knowing that Demetrius is finally dead. He was evil, you know, Marukakis. Completely evil. No doubt he was. But I'm afraid such concepts have become old-fashioned. All anyone cares about now is profit and loss and the stock exchange handbook. Another politician was assassinated in Bulgaria last week. Oh? The government has blamed the Serbs and promised to spend more on defense. But the assassin was a Serb. He worked for the Eurasian Credit Trust. No. Uh, they're heavily invested in the armaments trade, and thanks to him, we'll do rather well. They found themselves a new Demetrius, then? Yes, a new Demetrius. A new mask to hide behind. One man falls, another rises. But always and forever, the game goes on. As my train left Sofia, I began working on the plot of a new novel. I had wondered at first if I could return to writing cosy detective stories after being exposed to all the ugliness and brutality of the real world. But then I'd realized that it was the only way to escape it. An English village in high summer. An old lady murdered for her savings. An amateur sleuth and a handful of suspects. That was the sort of thing people wanted to read about. That was the sort of thing I wanted to read about myself. And the real world? The real world could go hang. The Mask of Demetrius by Eric Ambler was dramatized by Stephen Sheridan with original music by Neil Brand. Latimer was Jamie Glover. Demetrius, Tim McInerney. Mr. Peters, Desmond Barrett. Grodek, David Horovich, Walter Bulich, Richard O'Callaghan, Anna Bulich, Rachel Atkins, and Marukakis, Richard Attlee. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The Mask of Demetrius was a peer production for BBC Radio 4, directed by David Blount. <laughs>